Father. Teaching class. Father, we love you tonight. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Father, for your word that's about to go out. God, I thank you, Father, that your word is powerful. Your word is alive. Your word, <laughs> there's nothing like it, Father. Your word is the only words that can go out and cut down inside of our heart and our spirit. Thank you, Father. Tonight, as we hear this story from your word, that you're going to teach us something that we've never seen before in a way that we've never seen it before. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, we give you complete and utter authority in this place. You are our teacher, our leader, our guider, our comforter and friend. I thank you that this word, as it goes out today, that it can mean 39 different things in 39 different hearts. Thank you for making it personal to each one of us, to me and everyone that hears it tonight. Teach us that thing that we need to know, that little nugget from your word that we need to have in our life. I thank you for doing that now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be teaching the story of Naaman. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. 2 Kings chapter 5. This is one of the, my favorite stories in the Bible. Because this guy Naaman, he's, I don't know, I think maybe he's a lot like a lot, like a lot of us. Maybe a lot like me. <laughs> this, this guy Naaman was something else. We look in verse 1, it says, Now Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, he was a great man with his master, and he was honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. This guy, Naaman, this is the kind of guy that, you know, comes in and is always slapping everybody on the back and congratulating everybody, and he's just this, this you know, larger-than-life kind of guy that just is, you know, he's a good friend. And I looked up the words in Webster's, yes, 2 Kings chapter 5. I looked up some of these words in Webster's Dictionary, and it says great means notably large and grand. Well, I qualified. <laughs> Remarkable, full of emotion, eminent, distinguished, principal, noble, rich, great of soul. This guy Naaman was a great guy. I mean, everybody loved him, but he had this problem. It also says that great, this is the definition from the dictionary, markedly superior in character and quality, marked by enthusiasm. And then I looked at the word honorable in the dictionary. It says honorable is illustrious, deserving of respect, characterized by integrity honest and sincere. This guy Naaman had been second in command, second in power to the for the army of Syria. Only the king was more notable than Naaman. He had gone out and conquered and he had won battles. He was illustrious, deserving of respect, characterized by integrity, honest, sincere, creditable, trustworthy, possessing a strong sense of duty. Noble, decent, ethical, just, upstanding, a stand-up guy, fair, reputable, respected, virtuous, polite. And then it says he was a mighty man in valor. And I looked up valor in the dictionary. Valor, it says, personal bravery in the face of danger. Heroic, courageous, bold, daring, greatness of spirit, strength in overcoming fear. That was Naaman. But, there's that word, but, he was a leper. Now, leprosy, back then especially, was like significant of sin. It was equated with sin. And leprosy, back in Bible times, you know, you might get something, it might start as just a little pimple or a little mark on, on your hand or your foot or something, and, and it starts out, it gets infected, and then it, it kind of grows and festers and it gets worse and worse. And isn't that just like what sin does? It may start out as just a, a little thing. 
and it gets worse and worse. And you know, have you ever gone out to your, I don't know, your garbage can, and there might be a, a dead frog or a dead fish or something, something dead out by your garbage in the hot Florida sun for a couple of weeks? You know what it smells? Yeah, it stinks. It's horrible. Well, these poor people, lepers, people who had leprosy back in Bible times, their skin would begin to rot and stink. And they would scratch it, and then they'd have it here. And they'd scratch their face, and it would go there. And they'd scratch here, and it would spread. It would spread all over. And what lepers had to do back then, they had to wrap themselves, almost like a, a mummy, and wrap themselves in bandages to, you know, to cover up the sin, the leprosy. And eventually, this guy, Naaman, who was a great guy, he was valorous, he was brave, he had the favor of the king, he, couldn't, he could no longer do his job because of the leprosy was spreading all over and he had to keep wrapping himself and wrapping himself more and more. And he could no longer hug his kids, no longer kiss his wife. As a matter of fact, lepers back then, what they had to do is they, they would have to go, whenever they went out in town or whatever, they would have to yell out before them, unclean, unclean so that everybody backed away so nobody could get close to him. Leprosy started out as one little thing, but it just would grow and grow and get worse and worse and stink and rot until it would finally rob him of his position, rob him of his job, rob him of his family, rob him of his friends, his relationship with his soldiers and his men. And this was like taking the very essence of what who and what Naaman was. He was this big, gregarious, happy guy that, hey, how you doing? I ain't hugging you. Not with that leprosy. Because the end of leprosy always resulted in death. The end of sin always results in death if it's allowed to continue to grow and fester. Finally, they would have to go and live in a leper colony away from everybody else. So here's this guy, Naaman. He's got everything going for him. He's rich. He's powerful, he's well-respected, well-liked, well-loved, but he's got this one little problem. He's a leper. Verse 2, the Syrians had gone out by companies, and they had brought away a captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So in one of their battles, they brought back a servant girl as, as a slave, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And look at this, this tells you what kind of a what kind of a guy he was. And she said to her mistress, Oh, would God that my Lord were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And why did this little girl care that he would be recovered of his leprosy? You would think if she's a slave, she would say, oh, Good, serves him right. Hope he dies. Then maybe I can go free. But see, that's not who Naaman was. Naaman treated everyone with kindness and respect and honorably. And you're going to see that in the story where people that shouldn't have been fond of him <coughs> were fond of him. There's something about this guy named He really was a great guy. And so she said, oh, if only he could get to the prophet in Samaria, he could be healed from his leprosy. And verse 4, and someone went in and told his lord, the king, saying, thus and thus says the maid that's from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed, and he took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. So the king of Syria sent a letter, a personal letter, to the king of Israel, who he had conquered. And he says, I'm sending now my servant, Naaman, and he's bringing all these gifts. And here's what the letter said. And he brought the letter to the king and saying, Now when this letter comes to thee, behold, I have herewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Now let's just stop for a moment right there and think about this picture, because I always think things in pictures. And you have Naaman going from Syria to Israel. He's traveling through the desert. And what does he have with him? He has... Ten talents of silver, 
and 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of raiment. Now I looked that up, that's 750 pounds of silver, which by today's price is about $288,000 worth of silver. And the gold is 150 pounds of gold. And that's somewhere around three and a half million dollars worth of gold. Now, you don't, you don't get this picture of Naaman, you know, walking through the desert by himself carrying three and a half million in gold and a quarter million dollars in silver and ten, no. Naaman, when he traveled, he traveled in an entourage. He had servants and slaves and tent putter uppers and tent taker downers and he had people that cooked for him and he had soldiers, he had guards, bodyguards. I mean, you're carrying three and a half million dollars worth of gold, you better have some real <laughs> So he, This was a big procession that went from Syria to Israel. Now you gotta think about this, okay, the king of Israel is sitting on his throne one day and here comes this procession. And this procession of soldiers and, and men and bodyguards and, and, you know, and this is the guy who beat him in war. And he's got to be thinking to himself, uh oh, oh, what did I do wrong now? What's going to happen? What's he going to do? Is he going to kill me? Is he going to wipe out the rest of the country? What, what's up? And Naaman comes marching into the palace at, at Jerusalem and he comes up to the, to the king of Israel and he gives the letter and the king of Israel reads the letter saying, I want you to heal him of his leprosy. And it says, it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes. Yeah, that's what it's like a thing they did back then. They were, <laughs> they were like when they're distressed, they would rip their clothes and scream and cry. And sometimes they put ashes and dirt on their head. And they did all kinds of weird stuff to show that they were distressed. So he rent his clothes and he said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see, he seeketh a quarrel against me. He thinks the king of Syria is looking to take a fight. He's distressed. And it was so, verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent message to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. Now, you've got you to picture this. Here, Naaman brought his whole entourage into the palace, and the king can't help him. What does he have to do? He's got to turn around. And you've got to be thinking, this guy Naaman, he's thinking, Don't, doesn't he know who I am? I'm Naaman. I'm honorable. I'm rich. I'm royal. I'm second in command. What do you mean? I got to turn around and leave the palace and go to some prophet's house. And he, he I could just think he's probably not liking this. But he goes and he turns around the whole procession, all right, with the bodyguards and the and the servants and the soldiers and the tent putter uppers and tent taker downers and the the weeding roasters and all the his, everybody that takes care of him, well, he turns the whole procession around and he comes to Elisha's house. And so here he is. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. So here's Naaman. All right, well, I hope he appreciates this. Here I am at Elisha's house. And here's this very important man, very rich, very famous, very honorable, good guy, but maybe he's got a little problem with pride. So Naaman came and he stood at the door and Elisha sent a messenger to him. The messenger was Gehazi, that's his servant. What's a Gehazi? Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So Elisha doesn't even come out to greet him. Can you imagine what's going through like Naaman's mind at this point? He's like, what the heck? Don't they know who I am? I'm Naaman. I'm royal. 
I'm rich. I'm honorable. I'm, you know, all these things. And he's standing there, and he sends out a Gehazi to tell him, well, just turn around again and go wash in the Jordan River. Verse 9 says, so Naaman, no, we get that. Verse 11, but Naaman was wroth. He was really, wrong is a strong word in the old English. He was upset. And he went away. And he said, behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me. And he'll stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. And he will strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Hmm. Didn't quite go down. Yeah. No. <laughs> He had it all figured out how God was supposed to do this. But God doesn't always do things the way we think that he should do them. <clears throat> so here goes Naaman. And he's got to turn this whole procession around again. And he's storming off. He's not on his way to the Jordan River. He's not. He is angry. We'll see that in the next verse. Naaman was wroth. He said... He went away. He said, Behold, I thought surely he'll come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He said, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? See, he did have a little bit of a pride problem. You think? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. He was really upset. I don't think he was on his way to the Jordan River. I could be wrong, but I don't think that's the direction he was going. Now, this is really cool. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake to him and said, My father, his servant, he's in his chariot. He's probably going fast. I don't know about you, but when I'm upset, maybe I tend to drive a little faster than usual. Yeah. And he's, he's rushing off. He's wroth. He's in a rage. He's, he's going full steam ahead back to where the leprosy came from, back to Syria. There's nothing to go back to. When we have a sin problem, there's nothing to go back to. you got to move forward. So here he is going, and one of his servants comes to him, and look what he calls him. He says, my father. See, that gives me an idea of what kind of guy this Naaman was. His servants called him my father. He really was a great guy. He really had a big heart. He was, he was a good guy. He just had this one little problem, this leprosy. And the servant said to him, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? If he told you to stand on your head for 39 days, wouldn't you have done it? This is life and death. This is whether you live or die. This, this leprosy will take away your position. It will take away your authority. It will take away your family. It will take away everyone you love. It will take everything that is important to you, and it will rob you of it. That's what sin does. Wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? And you got to think about it. I don't, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but you got to think. He's going fast. He's in a rage. Maybe he slows down a little bit. Maybe he slows down a little more. Maybe the horses start walking, and he's thinking to himself, <clears throat> They know who I am. I'm Naaman. I'm royal. I'm honorable. I'm rich. I'm washing the Jordan River. That nasty, muddy river? You gotta be kidding me. And and Elijah, Elisha didn't even come out to see me. <clears throat> but then the chariot stops. And at some point he goes to the Jordan River. And then there's one more thing that I got to, you know, I'm just crazy this way. I picture how things had to happen because the next verse says he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan. But something had to happen because here's Naaman on his chariot 
and he's like up above everybody. He's up here in his royal chariot. He's on his high horse, if you will. <laughs> and he's and all of his soldiers are there, and his servants, and the, the maids that clean up, and the ones who cook and take down the tents and put up the tents, and, and he's there with all of his people, and he's probably dressed in a very royal robe. He probably has a very royal looking headdress on. And back then they didn't have speedos or whatever, you know, bathing suits. So here this guy has to climb down from his chariot. He's got to climb down. Everybody gets down out of a chariot the same way. There's no dignified way to do it. He's climbing down. He's got to take off his royal headdress. He's got to take off his royal robe. He probably had to strip butt naked in front of his servants, in front of his soldiers, in front of the people that put up and took down his tents and cooked for him. I mean, let's just be real. This had to happen, something like this. And Naaman had to get down to where he looked just like anybody else. You couldn't tell he was royal anymore. You couldn't tell he was rich anymore. You couldn't tell anything about him other than leprosy. Rotting, stinking flesh. People would have their noses fall off, their ears fall off, their eyelids fall off, their fingertips fall off from leprosy. It doesn't say what stage he was, but it's a horrible, horrible disease. And he's got to slip into the muddy, nasty Jordan River, probably butt naked. And how many times? Yeah. How many times? And he had to go in there, and he's got to be thinking, and I, I don't know, I just get inside of his head, he's going, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> and he comes up out of the river. There's no change. Nothing happened. He's got to be thinking to himself, oh my God, what did I get myself into? And he goes down again. <sighs> he comes up. Still no change. He goes down again. Maybe he stays down a little bit longer this time. <clears throat> Still no change. I don't know about you, but if it was me, at this point, I would be thinking exit strategy. I'm thinking, how in the world do I get my naked butt up out of this river and get back to my chariot and go back home and just, you know, forget that this whole thing ever happened. But here he is. He goes down again four times. <clears throat> Still. Nothing happening. He's got to be thinking, I don't believe that I did this. Why did I do this? I'm Naaman. I'm the second in command to the king of Syria. I'm royal. I'm rich. I'm honorable. But I'm a leper. I've got this problem. This problem is going to rob everything that I love or care or everything is dear to me. got to be racing through his mind. What do I do if this doesn't work? He goes down again six times. Stays down a real long time this time. <clears throat> Still nothing. Leprosy. Smelly, rotty, rotten, disgusting flesh. He's got to be thinking, this is working. Yeah. <laughs> He's got to be, how do I get back in my chariot with nobody seeing me, put on my clothes, put on my royal, and get my royal butt out of here. But he goes down one more time. And when he comes up, the Bible says, his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. 
Now, it doesn't say how old of a man Naaman was, but to have won all these battles and be this powerful and in charge, I would think he had to be at least maybe 40, maybe 50, maybe 60. He'd been in some battles. There were scars, pimples, wrinkles. There were blemishes even before the leprosy. The Bible says his skin came again like as the flesh of a newborn baby. God healed him. God removed the sin, forgave him, and God washed it away. God made it look like he had never even sinned before. The Bible says that God has made him Jesus Christ to actually be, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what God did for us. He removes our sin. He forgives our sin. He just doesn't cover it over. He washes it totally away. He will remove and heal the hurts the things that have hurt us, the things that that sin has caused in our life. He will restore relationships. He'll restore broken hearts. He'll restore relationships and families back together. If God did it for Naaman, he'll do it for any one of us. That's who our God is. So loving, so kind to not only forgive us, not only heal us, not only remove our sin from us, but to restore the damage that it did to our lives. Naaman came out of that water like a brand new baby. Clean, pure, restored in every way. That's what God wants to do for each and every one of us. If we'll obey. Come down off our high horse take off our raiment of who we are, get rid of our pride, <laughs> get naked before him, and go down in the river. Amen. Amen.